I'd like to welcome you here tonight. We're just a couple of minutes away from beginning. Uh, we'll begin. Uh, I'll ask you to stand and join me in the pledge, and then Brian Powell will bring the invocation. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Join me in prayer, if you will. Father, thank you for today. We love you, and we just thank you for the beauty that you've given us today. And Father, we just want to pause and ask that you would uh, please uh, provide for those who've been hit by the storms that came through Monday. Ask that you would just provide for their needs, protect them, Father God. And thank you for your hand of protection on the rest of us. And just ask that you just be with us tonight as uh, we deal with the city's business. Thank you for the privilege and the honor it is to be able to... Uh, ask you would give us the wisdom that we need to be able to make the right decisions for our city thank you again for your blessings we love you and we ask you bless us tonight in your name we pray amen amen thank you brian all right i'd like to again welcome you to uh this regular meeting of the springdale city council tuesday october 22nd we've got large print agendas over here Somebody, I guess, is trying to say something to me. They handed me one. So, uh, thank you for giving it to me. Uh, yeah, but we, we've got those over there if that would be helpful to anyone. Uh, so, we'll call the meeting to order. I have, uh, uh, I think I've done everything now. We're ready to do the roll call. Denise? Mayor Sprouse? Here. Amelia Williams? Here. Jeff Watson? Here. Mike Overton? Here. Colby Fulfer? Here. Mike Lawson? Rick Evans, Here. Brian Powell, Here. Kathy Jacobs, Here. Ernest K. All right, thank you. We're at item four on the agenda. This is the portion of each meeting that the council sets aside to hear comments from our citizens. If we have, uh, if we have residents that would like to address the council, uh, we ask that you come to the microphone, clearly state your name and address. Please keep your comments brief and understand that the council won't take any action on anything you bring forward tonight. Uh, so if there's anyone that would like to address the council concerning something that is not already on tonight's agenda, you're welcome to come at this time. Hello, my name is, my name is Tim Heilman. Um, I'm not a citizen of Springdale. Uh, I have property in Elm Springs. It's uh, in Camelot subdivision. And um, I, was in, I was in this room earlier this year, I guess it was, and they were doing the uh, ordinance on Riggins on the uh, building some homes on Ball Street. Yes. In, there by County Line Road. And I'll be brief. And I noticed since you know we've had rains, uh, the water flow has changed and you know, it, it, it's changed to where there's more water coming into Camelot subdivision. And my concern is this, I know we're putting together the, Springdale's putting together the ballpark there on Carrie Smith and Ball. And <clears throat> my concern is when all that's hardscaped up there and when the cart cottages complex is hardscaped, I notice that there's some concrete tunnels that's going through the property and my concern is water's gonna travel faster and be more concentrated, and it's gonna hit that uh, King Arthur and Camelot subdivision harder than it's been hit prior. And my understanding was, it looks and appears that there's gonna be a lake and some other retention things up there. I just wanted to bring attention and just put it on record that it's been pretty bad uh, prior to this development up there and and I just don't want to see it get worse and I hope that someone's really looking out for that uh, to protect the citizens of Alma Springs and those property owners uh, because the concern was when Riggins developed that you know that was going to be taken care of as far as uh, the water and their retention ponds on the Riggins development were almost completely dry after we had that record rainfall on their property. Anyway, I just wanted to go on record and hopefully that 
the city of Springdale is looking out for the citizens of Elm Springs in this new park development. Right. We thank, are. We are. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you very Tim. much. Thank you, Tim. Uh, I know that we are. Uh, the drainage has been a big discussion during that time, and that we are retaining a lot of water uh, on that site. So we will. But we will keep an eye and make sure that we are building what was designed. All right. Thank you. All right. Uh, item five: quarterly economic development report. Scott Edmondson's here. Scott. Good evening. Thank you, Mayor Sprouse and Council. <clears throat> it's been a uh, busy quarter on the economic development front. A uh, lot of things going on us uh, on the manufacturing side. We have several uh, existing companies that are looking at expanded possible expansion projects. And then we've also had inquiries working with a couple of companies that are looking at possibly relocating into Springdale. So uh, uh, hopefully we'll have more news in the coming months on those. Uh, there's been uh, quite a bit of interest also on the retail side, restaurant side, and then downtown development is certainly uh, uh, been a point of emphasis. And uh, we've had a lot of inquiries about possible <clears throat> uh, restaurants and retail outlets in our downtown. So uh, one thing, our new job numbers for the uh, through July were uh, we had 200 2,269 new jobs created in Springdale from January through July, and that's according to the Department of Workforce Services, and that's a 45% increase over the same time period in 2018. Our sales tax receipts of 1.3 million in September, that was a 6.7% increase over September of last year. And our unemployment rate, it's still one of the lowest in the state at 2.5%, and the state rate is 3.4%. Uh, our construction permits uh, for uh, commercial and residential <laughs> in the third quarter of, of this year uh, greatly surpassed what was going on in 2018. Our commercial permits were up 45 percent <laughs> and residential permits were up 89 percent in the in the third quarter. Uh, several new uh, grand openings with the uh, opening of the Mercy Health Clinic. Uh, we had the groundbreaking for the new animal shelter recently. And uh, construction continues on the uh, new come and go, the BNSF logistics office out on 48th Street, as well as uh, the O'Reilly Auto Parts store coming in on North Thompson, and uh, some things out, some things out west as far as with with the Smoothie King, and then we've got a, a new car wash there on a, on Sunset. Inwax Inwax campus is progressing nicely, and we're hoping that'll be open for the spring semester. So uh, I also want to thank you for uh, your attendance to the Chicken Peeling Politic event. We had over 500 people attend here down at Shiloh Square uh, on October 3rd. And we also have our Workforce Summit, the Northwest Arkansas Workforce Summit. That's scheduled for December 4th at the, uh, the Convention Center, which that's an opportunity for uh, <clears throat> educators and manufacturers to get to, uh, um, to network and learn about each other's needs basically so and then also economics arkansas recently presented their excellence in free enterprise award to gary george the gary george and family here in, of springdale during their october 7th luncheon and they also recognized dr jim rollins for his for his service to not only the springdale school district but uh his his service to the economics arkansas board so any questions for scott anyone thank you sir Appreciate thank you very it. much all right, item six, uh, we have the report tonight on the uh, needs assessment for Parks and Rec. Stephen Dittmore is here, and uh, Stephen would like to take, uh, I think I think you're shooting for about 15 minutes, so yes, give us the, the upshot, and I'm sure if there are questions that you'll entertain those as well. Be happy to. Thank uh, you, thank Mayor you. Sprouse. Thank you, members of City Council. Um, so um, I gave copies of the presentation since I know some of the print is going to be small. You all have copies. There were some copies that are up here at the front if anybody is interested in that. Um, we have with us tonight several of the students that worked on the project as well as, as my colleague Dr. Mary Mosicek. Each of us is going to present a, a short bit of this. So um, first of all, we uh, appreciated the opportunity to go ahead and, and do this. The purpose of our study was to help uh, assess kind of what the future direction of Springdale Parks and Recreation 
could be used looking at facilities and programming primarily. Uh, we did not do anything from a risk management standpoint with facilities. We gathered data in a number of ways. We held public meetings in this space on both June 3rd and June 5th. We had a focus group with select uh, area organizations that are engaged in recreation and, and sport programming. We met with parks and recreation staff. We developed an online survey for interest, for interest that uh, was informed by the results of the public meetings and the focus groups. And then we did some general research into youth sports programming. And that last bullet is the piece that I'm going to be speaking on tonight. Um, the other thing that we did is we benchmarked Springdale against uh, two cities that were NRPA, National Recreation Parks Association, gold medal finalist cities, Coppell, Texas, and Westerville, Ohio. Westerville was the winner of this year's 2019 award. We also looked at average city facilities according to what NRPA says is kind of the benchmark. And then we also considered the other three major communities here in Northwest Arkansas in terms of what they offer their citizens. So we looked at Bentonville, Fayetteville, and Rogers as well. The reports uh, of the those, the details of all those things are in the document that I shared with the mayor that I know has been shared with the members of the City Council here this evening. Um, looking at youth sports programming, uh, one of the things that really stood out to us as we were doing the research is a, an initiative that the Aspen Institute has begun for their Project Play program and this public service campaign began on August 4th. Uh, of this year, so after we were already underway with our, our research, and it's called Don't Retire Kid, and it features public service announcements, and perhaps if you've watched ESPN over the last several months, you've seen these, they've been airing exclusively on there where kids go to the microphone and announce their retirement, and 10.52 is the average age at which kids discontinue sports participation in the United States. So not a great trend that by the time that a kid is 11 years old or essentially, you know, a, a sixth grader or a fifth grader, they have they have retired, so to speak, from sports. Um, based upon what we used from the American Community Survey to assess how many residents in Springdale are under the age of 18, and the data that we got from Springdale Parks and Rec about the number of youths who participated in organized youth sports, less than one in five Springdale youths participated in organized team sports through the city. Now, this doesn't count travel sports participation, but less than one in five participated in 2017. The average, according to the uh, Aspen Institute, is about 38% nationally. So 38% of youths under the age of 18 participating in, in organized youth sports. So again, this number doesn't necessarily reflect everyone in Springdale who participates in organized youth sports, but it does illustrate that it's a little bit low, less than the national average. Uh, the decline in Springdale youth tackle football mirrors the national data from the Aspen Institute. So we see declines in uh, organized tackle football uh, pretty much in line with that. Youth participation in soccer and baseball in Springdale was strong, showing growth uh, in a four-year window for which we had data from 2016 through the first half of 2019. Um, and one thing that we talk a lot about in the report and one of the recommendations might be to consider some sort of cooperative public-private association to help deliver sports programming to, uh, to the citizens uh, and the residents of Springdale. We notice that Coppell, Texas does this. Westerville, Ohio does not. Um, so both models can, can elevate a city to the NRPA gold status. Uh, but one of the things that Coppell does is it works with its local school district to develop an association that basically has individuals focused on a given sport. I'm going to choose uh, football or baseball or lacrosse, any of those sports that are popular there, that allows the association to develop kids early on that then matriculate into college, or excuse me, into high school, I'm used to talking about college, into high school and into the school districts and then play on the varsity high school teams in that community. So uh, it is using the city parks and rec facilities in Coppell, but it is managed externally, not through the parks and rec department. Uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over to uh, one of our master students, Nathan. Uh, he's going to talk a little bit about some of the benchmarking that we did with the other cities. Um, this map is a visual representation of the city of Springdale and where the parks and school playgrounds are. Uh, NRPA suggests that a park or playground should be within a half mile radius of any household so that um, families have one that's readily available to go use at any given time. And as you can see, when you get further west in Springdale, there are less parks for those developments. Um, and then we 
measured all of the, the radius based off of Google Earth's um, ruler that it has, this little tool um, that it has on there. And based off the benchmark facilities needed is about 178 acres of parks and parkland space. Um, more multi-purpose rectangular fields, splash pads, pickleball courts and sand volleyball. And then two things that are unique to Springdale are the pump track and the ice rink inside the Jones Center. Do you mind if I, I, we should hold our questions, I guess, but if I don't ask it when I'm thinking of it, so if that's all right, I, I just want to be clear on what the 178 acres represents. What's that? More uh, needed. 178 more to, acres needed? Yes, more For needed. our population? Uh, Is for, that how for the population needed for okay. The, yes. Okay. Um, and so obviously this um, chart is hard to read, but going from left to right, it shows the, um, the amount of acreage or fields that we need for the city of Springdale. Um, the second column shows um, the one, how much is required. The third is this total um, facilities that Springdale does have currently. And then the last one on the right is what is suggested to fulfill the NRPA standards. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Is that including the Shaw Park that's about to go in? I believe so. Yeah. No. So we've got 115 acres in development right okay. now. Okay. Well, that help that helps us. That helps. Yes. Yeah, thank you. Um, and then we benchmark adult sport programming. So Springdale has fewer than all of the other uh, five cities that we um, measured up against. Uh, we only have about one per season, um, fall, spring, summer, and winter. And then for youth sports, we show a wider variety compared to the other um, Northwest Arkansas communities. And then we measure up relatively well with Westerville with more instructional-based programming. We're offering a lot more clinics um, and one-day camps for kids. Um, and then on here, some of the benchmarking shows that we need to offer more adult programming um, and then more competitive youth sports year-round. So I'll turn it over to Natalie. Can you while she's coming, can you back that slide up one? I'm sorry. Okay, thank you. Okay, so one of the things that we did was we held a focus group as well as community forums to develop any information and generate ideas that um, the community wanted, what facilities and programs they were interested in. So from those two things, we developed questions that were then used to generate a survey. Um, and the survey was translated into English, Spanish, and Marshallese, which I'll explain a little bit more about that here in a moment. Um, but that was how we got information from the public. And we did so by emailing 1,580 um, email addresses. So we used a private company that um, they sent out random emails based on the zip code. So anyone that had an email um, that was located here in Springdale, they had the opportunity to receive that. Um, there were three separate emails that were sent out to those same addresses. And one of the reasons that we decided to continue with gathering data was because there was a low open and completion rate. So basically, someone could receive that email and they either saw it and didn't want to open it or it could have gone to spam, something like that. So when we're talking about open and completion rates, that's usually what we're dealing with. Um, and so we had low open and completion rates. We then used the Parks and Recreation database and their Facebook page um, to reach out to more people to then um, have them fill out the survey again via email. And with those, we only sent two emails and there were 645 responses. Um, so I mentioned that the survey was translated into three languages um, and that is based on the race, education, and household income based on some of the, the demographics here in Springdale. Um, our three focused areas, again, were race, education, and household income. And we chose these because these are the three things that, um, that most impact someone's opportunity to participate in parks and recreation programming. 
And if you look at these graphs, this will show the demographics for Springdale as reported in the U.S. Census as well as the, um, the report that they do in between that. I believe it's the community survey. Um, the actual numbers are in the blue and then the observed numbers are that red color. Um, looks kind of black from where you're sitting. Um, you can look at this and see that Caucasian, that, um, that area was overrepresented by our survey, um, or by the results, excuse me. And then the Hispanic and Latino population was underrepresented. So there were a couple things that we wanted to make sure we pointed those out, as well as the Asian Pacific Islander um, part population. What's the difference between actual and observed? Um, the actual is the population that is measured by the U.S. Census and that those groups and then the observed were those were those that filled out the survey. Um, and so like I mentioned the um, Caucasian group was overrepresented and then ha Hispanic and Latino as well as Asian and Pacific Islander which includes that Marshallese population those were underrepresented. And then when we're also looking at education, um, this covers everything from some school in general to having a graduate degree. Um, and there is some over-representation here as well, um, specifically with graduate degree and bachelor's degrees. So those that um, completed the survey were more likely to have those degrees in comparison to the actual population um, in Springdale. And so that was something we wanted to know, as well as underrepresented um, were high school diploma or a GED, those, type, those respondents. And then lastly, household income. Um, this was also interesting as well. We saw that the more than $100,000 per year household income, that was overrepresented. Um, and then a lot of the other groups were fairly close with the exception of groups or individuals excuse me, households that were less than $20,000. So again, that darker color is the observed. Those were the people that filled out the survey. And the lighter blue color, that is the actual population of Springdale. So some conclusions about these demographics. It's important to consider these again because those were the things that determine basically who participates in parks and recreation. So it's important that we understand those things as well as who fill those out. Um, and some of the points that we wanted to make were, again, there were some over-representations and under-representations by who actually participated. Um, there were more white respondents. Springdale is only 20% white if we look at the actual numbers, but that was, was actually higher in the survey responses. Um, higher college degree respondents, so like I mentioned, some of those graduate degrees, um, bachelor's degrees, a lot of individuals that hold those degrees participated, more so than the general population. And then income over $75,000 in the household. So Springdale is only 24.6%, um, those that have a higher income over 75000 So a little bit of an overrepresentation. And then next we have Ian, who's going to talk about um, our survey program. I, I have a quick question. Yes. Was there anything done with uh, like women versus men? I know Springdale are. I can't hear what you're saying. Oh, sorry. Do we have any information on demographic demographics for the women versus men? I know we had a huge problem with uh, women's sports in Springdale falling off um, and uh, leagues closing participations down. So I was wondering if any of that information was included. We asked a question. Mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure we did. <coughs> I'm sorry. Okay. And is there any data on women's sports or girls' sports, youth or adult? There is some feedback from the surveys about uh, increasing the amount of women's and girls' participation that we're going to get to. Oh, okay. Um, because there's a lot of that. That you miss, uh, but not asking to get their participation. Thank you. One question. The 20% you said of more white yeah. respondents, 20%, I thought it was the... 
That, but this shows 20 percent. That, because in your report you said 49.1. Okay. All right. So I'm going to talk about some of the themes that we uh, found from the responses. Um, and yes, uh, to go off of that, there was um, definitely an interest in increasing uh, female participation in developing sports for that. So um, we'll get into that a little bit more here shortly, but that is definitely something that is of interest and maybe something to look at as you guys move forward. So um, just overall, I'd have to say um, responses uh, were very, uh, people that participated in our survey were very happy with the product that Springdale Parks and Rec is providing and they're especially happy with the prices per product um, and they enjoyed uh, non-sport programming events and I think that's something to look into further is providing ev um, programs that are not just basically sport relevant so looking at other sort of uh, cultural or arts or all those sort of different things to help develop I think the community is looking into that and that's something of interest um, Another thing that people were really import, uh, excited about was how youth sports fosters community. Um, you have a really great uh, poll in that sense, and people were really uh, appreciative of what sports had done for their children and the community itself. Uh, one of the things that we did see, though, was there there's a need for more organization in the sport department, and nothing negative, really, but just more um, in regards to planning and scheduling of um, teams in the fields, those sort of thing, and more uh, efficiency in the re registration process. So kind of easy, I think, things that can definitely be changed and altered to be more efficient down the road. Uh, we also saw that there's a need for more recreational leagues, competitive sport leagues, um, sport options, maybe even looking to the female uh, aspect of things, um, providing more opportunities for them, and also uh, adult sport leagues is definitely something that people would like to do uh, in the future. I think uh, moving forward here, we have one of the biggest takeaways is for the community of Springdale, the parks are really important and they provide a significant impact in most of you guys' lives. A lot of what we saw was that families and individuals um, utilize the parks for various reasons for all sorts of things, from just general exercise, to walking their dog, um, to seeing their children play, um, all sorts of things. It's a really important piece and that's why this is such an awesome opportunity to be a part of is because this is the future and it impacts so much the Spring Valley community. So, with that, um, overall, uh, the respondents were really impressed with the cleanliness of the parks and the facilities. And I, we weren't sure how people were responding, because obviously there's a lot of takeaways from here. But the fact that there's certain things that are, this parks and rec department are doing really well, I think we can capitalize and we can bring up the strengths and the weaknesses together. But the one thing that did come up as a concern, though, was the purchase of new next level. And I think that's an opportunity, though, because there's so much that can be done with that. And so looking at that, moving forward here, we go into the focus group. Oh, is that the, yes. And so what was pretty impressive was the concerns that came up in the surveys um, were kind of, uh, we were able to dive into a little bit d deeper in the focus group. Um, and one of the things that we, we saw uh, that was a kind of a, a way to kind of uh, curve tail or to move forward this process was to almost develop a program coordinator position which would um, take care of some of these um, needs for programming and uh, some of the issues that we saw with um, scheduling and planning and all those sort of things. Uh, this person would be in charge of kind of, you know, implementing what would be utilized at what park, um, maybe dividing that up so that we can utilize our resources more appropriately. Another thing that was kind of discussed was that transportation is the largest barrier to why people aren't using the parks or having a hard time getting involved or whatever the case. And um, that sport programmer may be able to, you know, again, divide up some things to make it easier for people to be more accessible to do the things that they'd like to do. And moving from that, uh, we decided, we from the focus group, there was a discussion on uh, 
a community reaction board to be created. And I want to say that the members that came to the focus group were incredible. There are some really brilliant minds in this community that I think we really need to tap into because there's some game changers. And I really think those people will really help in this process and us coming together as a group to do that. I think that's what's going to move it forward. And they, again, those guys, they were really on point with some of the things to kind of develop this, this movement. Um, we also thought that a strategic plan of how parks and rec should move forward should be developed. And um, one of the biggest takeaways was that there's a wide variety of facilities and we really have some of the best in the area. And this could be a, a platform to really build off of and develop Springdale as utilizing youth sports as a way to do that. So that's pretty much what I have. So I'm Dr. Mosichek, and um, I'm going to talk about with OK 11 things that we recommend from this report. The first is a strategic plan. For those of you who don't know what that is, that's coming up with a mission, vision of where you want and the direction you want the Parks and Rec Department to go, which would also include an action plan for between a five and 10 year period. Um, you need to add more parks and while they said the 115 acres didn't wasn't included I really think it was included and you are also short in the number of parks so that would be something for you to consider identifying where are those parks going to go <clears throat> all of that costs money people were more for an HMR tax the law on the HMR tax is that Arkansas can charge, a community in Arkansas can charge up to 4%. 1% of that can go to parks and recreation. As long as you have a park that is a regional size where you can put on tournaments, you have that. Um, the other department that uses that a lot is Fayetteville. The other ones don't use it so much. I recommend you do. That pulls in money from outside your city letting tourists pay for hotel motel and restaurant percentages we do have a we do have a hotel tax we do not have a restaurant tax but none of it goes to parks and recreation correct and, and i think bentonville also you mentioned fable doesn't bentonville also have a restaurant tax that goes to parks i don't know i believe that's the case but i'm not sure but thank you at any rate you can do it on motel and hotel as well and 1% of that can go to your Parks and Rec. And um, <clears throat> we also recommend that you keep talking to a, developing a board of community programmers. According to Chad, you've already started that. It's a great way to help all of the community recreation sports people work together. We also recommend that you organize meetings with the school district. They've got transportation they've got fields and most of the departments have strong partnerships with their community not sure then evaluate your organization of the sports programs as dr. Dittmore uh, presented identify sport associations interested in taking over those programs Complete your recreation center in Shaw Park. Continue your, your sports academies. That is, those are programs that train kids to come up and uh, do and improve their skills so that when they get into to a sports league, they're better than they would have been had they not done that. Increase your non-sports programs, which would also be uh, in order to do that hiring as a programmer and on every single questionnaire everybody wants splash pads so you can put one in every park and everybody would be joyous and that's our presentation do you have any questions I have a question you said on number seven identify sports associations interested in taking over programs are you are you talking about the private private sector no, I'm talking about non nonprofits like um, Blanus, Rotary. Or, or it could be a public private partnership, I think, was what I was alluding to more.
or that um, would utilize public facilities, have the ability to organize, sell sponsorships, take on the onus of maintaining. Being, no, take on the onus of officiating umpires, coaches, the organization right. of all that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that's what a lot of cities do. And one of the things it does is it increases the amount of people that are interested in the sport and they recruit for you and you get more participation. It sometimes increases the amount of headaches because if Chad doesn't like what they're doing, then he has to deal with how to make changes there. What you do, what people do is set up their own nonprofit to provide their softball programs or their baseball programs. Right. right. I just feel like I feel like we're working with um, city leagues that are dropping off. So our alternative might be looking at the private sector for help and it's certainly a in building building that back up or doing it on their own, just taking it away from the city. Has that ever been done? Where the city does is not it doesn't deal with this. They just maintain the facilities and the parks. And then if somebody else does yeah, the sports I mean, that's completely. Fairly analogous to Coppell, Texas. Um, I can send you the link to their websites. Uh, I just thought. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, they, that's essentially what they they do. Uh, have private private associations that run. So I think that would might be a good option for us. And our recommendation is explore it. But those are nonprofits. They can be nonprofits, and they can be for profits. Well, we'd um, have we'd have some. We might have some tax issues with for profits, but it depends on how they're how it's set up. You would set it up in such a way that the the amount of money they bring in, a percentage would go to the city for rental of the facilities and maintenance. It wouldn't be by by rental. You could do it by rental, but you want to keep your foot in the the activity because you want to make sure that they don't ruin the facilities, don't leave people out, okay. only cater to the to the highly skilled instead of the kids who want to be there to have fun. You want to be sure, sure they're included. We've got, we've got some facilities that were purchased with tax-exempt bonds, so there are some restrictions on how money can be made on okay. the private side. So, But I, I, think, I think we can sure look at what other cities have done. You mentioned uh, the one in Texas, right? and uh sounds sounds interesting we so you've got your your program your your the status of springdale parks and recreation has come up a lot in the last five years and as any city you still have some steps to go but you're doing a good job and the fact that the comments were your prices are good and your cleanliness is high everybody would love to hear that thank you all I had a question about your process yes sir. yes um, how did you why did you pick Coppell Texas and Westerfield uh, again those were two of the finalists for the NRPA gold medal award in 2019 and they fit within the demo the population range they were if I remember off the top I had 30,000 to 75,000 so Kind of right in line with Springdale. Okay. Uh, Westerville is a suburb of Columbus, Ohio, has a little bit of a different demographic. Coppell is a suburb of the Dallas Fort Worth area, has a little different. So they demographic. were at, they were very good cities that correct. Took they were cities against. of excellence. Excellence. Okay. And then the second question, I heard a conversation about the survey and uh, how the survey was performed, but I didn't understand the focus group. How was that? What was that? We invited, uh, I think, 55 uh, recreation providers in the area, and but not 55 came. We had about eight come, uh, two from the Hispanic community. So the people that came were Kiwanis, Jones Center, the station, the art center of the Ozarks, and Teen Action and Support Center. The representatives from those. They all came and they were they were involved. We had a series of questions that we asked, 
they had a series of things they wanted to tell us. They didn't answer any of our questions, but we got a lot of good information from them. I thought that was interesting. Okay. Um, and then I have a question. Um, marketing, I, don't, I didn't see anything about improvement on marketing um, to drive up participation in youth sports. No one nobody indicated that. Nobody indicated that. And that we Parks needed. and Recreation. I saw that you said work with the schools. Right. Which has been a difficulty yeah. in itself. Parks and Recreation are not n known in general for their great marketing, mm -hmm. um, partly because they're nonprofit. You do a good job with your Facebook, mm -hmm. and our, their recommendation was to also get into the schools, get leaflets and flyers into the school. We know that that's difficult, but if you begin starting to communicate with the school, it should become easier. Yeah, it really shouldn't be that difficult. No, you get money from the same people. Yeah. Right. So. One, one last thing I wanted to correct, Mary, because we were talking about the uh, acreage of parkland. Yes. So this was an email I had asked Zachary Walls of Parks and Rec staff to provide. We currently have roughly 520 acres of parkland. This includes the 120 acres for the future site, okay. site of Shaw Family Park. All right, So Good. that's how we came up with that number. Thank you. So and that, there's still short acreage. Right. 10.52 years a child retires why yes. is that what was the explanation on that so explanation varies that was again the data point from the Aspen Institute and their project play it could be that the kids just are dropped out they aren't skilled enough to continue to play they lose they stop having fun was a big component of it part of project play is just they want to get kids back out playing just not being so competitive, not having such structured practices and being assigned to a position, allowing them to experience the whole gamut of, of that. Seventy percent of children drop out of sports that have started sports in junior high, which correlates with that. Right. And the reason, part of the reason is, is that schools start taking over sports around then and then it becomes skill based in who gets in and who doesn't well there's a gap there's a gap there and there's a gap between the middle school and the junior high and the, where the middle school so they're they're dropping off and there's no no place for them to go so they can't play the sport at all unless they go into travel or elsewhere and a big problem is transportation to get well, that's what i was about to say wouldn't uh, transportation is the largest barrier uh, and, and it, it, it wouldn't be a barrier if we kept some school teams that we used to have. We used to have home-based school teams like we have home schools. But there was a problem because the west side of town had three teams for a school and the east side of town was five schools for a team. Okay, so it really wasn't, wasn't working. And, and some of that has to do with culture-based? Well, it's not, it has nothing to do with culture. It has to do with poverty-based. Um, and the east side would have, um, you know, the five to one, the, the, and they couldn't, af they couldn't afford it. So what you're looking at is, is not just a transportation problem, but if you could help fix the so low socioeconomic issue of it, then transportation could be fixed with that. Okay, and that being some of these nonprofits or, you know, whatever to help these kids that can't afford the fees and can't afford the equipment to be able to have that, thus participation goes up, thus those schools on the east side then have home teams, and thus we don't have a problem. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. All right. Thank Anyone you. Anyone else? There's a lot of information in here. We just got this, this. I got it this afternoon. I think the email was sent this morning, but it's 95 pages of information. And I would, I'd like to be able to discuss more of the information in it at a committee meeting because I know we got a lot of people here for other issues as well. I think we've got, we've got the report. Uh, hopefully, hopefully we've got access to you if we yeah. need uh, uh, further clarification or on questions answered. On the website, I can give you a business card. Call. As our staff starts working uh, also we'll, we'll have to yeah okay, okay. thank yes. you uh it had well i guess it the, the council tonight, has it in our dropbox 
but uh, I don't see any problem with making it with making it public. It's like 95 pages, and and uh, I don't know how we put it on our website. Can we can we put that on our website without any trouble? Could be able to. Okay, we can have we can link to it on our website. Yeah, sure. Okay. Thank and, you. And we can also do this presentation tonight as well. Okay. That all good, Stephen? Very good. All right. Thank you all. Thank you all of you for your for your work. We appreciate it. All right. We'll move on to item seven. So moved. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. Thank you. Item eight, procedural motions. What's your pleasure, Council? A and B. You see the the nine uh, A through D and fourteen and fifteen. Great. The one day I said A and B. Make a motion. Yeah, I can't hear you at all. Most we have all a motion. this time tonight. I don't know what's going on. You made a I'm motion for A and B. <laughs> I made a motion for A and B. Oh, all right. It. Thank you. Do we have a second? I just seconded. Is there all right. Sorry, I'm. So, I've been quiet like that lately. Just A. A. Hey, bless please. your heart. Hal. <laughs> Hal. Cox. Yes. Williams. Yes. Watson. Yes. Overton. Yes. Fulfer. Yes. Evans. <clears throat> Seven zero. All right. Thank you, Luis. Are you up there? <clears throat> I think everybody everybody seems low to me. Can you bring us up just a little bit? I'll accept yours, Mayor. <laughs> I'll, call, I'll talk quieter. I think that's Thanks. better, maybe. Keep, keep, Thank uh, you. Mike, keep mics down, too. <laughs> 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 All right, item nine, Planning Commission Report and Recommendations. Patsy Christie, Director of Planning and Community Development. <clears throat> Patsy. The first item is a request to rezone property located on South 48th Street. It's a 1.69 acre track. The request is to rezone the property from Neighborhood Office District 01 to Planned Commercial District C4. I want to explain that a C4 commercial district is not something we see a lot, but it is designed to be whatever they tell us it's going to be. It's the closest thing to contract zoning we have, and in this case, it is for the construction of a funeral home, the one that's located on 48th Street, just down the street from it, would be relocated to this location. And we came, came forward with this to give the, the residents in the neighborhood some assurance that that's all it's going to be. Uh, Planning Commission reviewed this request and recommends approval of the rezoning request. The title of the ordinance reads, an ordinance amending ordinance number 3307, the same being the zoning ordinance of the City of Springdale, Arkansas, and the plat pertaining thereto by rezoning certain lands from Neighborhood Office District 01 to Plan Commercial District C4 and declaring an emergency. Okay, we have a motion and a second for approval. Any questions or comments by the council? Sorry, Mayor, I do. <laughs> they will have to come back with a large scale development plan. It'll so go on through that C4, um, explain that again. It's a planned commercial district. So they will tell us what are the uses going to be allowed. We have a site plan that shows roughly how it's going to be laid out. We don't have all of the details of the drainage and all that kind of stuff worked out, but we have a general site plan. We know how many parking spaces they're going to have, and we know what uses it's, it's oh, restricted kind of planned, to. Planned, planned commercial district is what it is. That has to be approved? Yes. And, it, and if they wanted to use it for something different, they would have to come back to this body rezone. to either have it rezoned to a C2 or something different or have the C4 changed from the use of a, of a funeral home to something different it could still be c4 but it would right. they might ask to, for some other right use. they'd have to ask for something different we only have a couple of other ones the civic center over on uh, 265 is a c4 district where we have designated uses for several of the buildings we've been back a couple of times and changed a couple of those but for the most part it hasn't and changed the, a lot the thinking on this particular piece of property was because it backs up to residential that's correct Right. It's more appropriate. When you go from an office district to a C2, you're, uh, you're introducing a lot of other possible uses that might not be as conducive to back up to those. Whereas a funeral home, we know what it's going to be. We know what kind of activities go on. And that's, I encourage them to come back with a C4. I thought that was the best way for us to have control on how this piece of property is going to be developed. Yeah. All right. I'm, I'm familiar with this mayor, and it, it seems like an appropriate use, plus it's directly across the street from the Ozark Guidance Center's properties, which is, this would be conducive to that environment. 
One of the questions asked at Planning Commission was, you know, the impact of funeral processions going down the street. Well, they're already on 48th Street. We're just locating them to a different location, that kind of thing. Uh, questions were asked about what it would do to property values. I can't say anything that would happen with Make property it more values convenient anymore. To yeah. drop them off. Yeah. Okay. Do you know what the parking would be on that? How many uh, we looked at it and I can't off the top of my head but it's substantially more than what they have at the existing location they have maximized it out as much but I, I don't want to give you a number because that's the number you'll remember whether it's right wrong or indifferent <laughs> and so I don't want to give you a number off the top of my head but if you want to call me tomorrow I'll look up and see what they yeah there will be a specific requirement yeah. and and they'll have to meet that and I think they had more parking than what the minimum would be required for the facility itself the only issue we had at ours was uh, every now and then you'd have a large service and then I think the city had to go in and put signs that say no parking on the street because it would just overflow but um, did any of the anybody there was some discussion about that because now I think people park across the street at the Holiday Inn and other places like that uh, I don't know how we regulate you, you don't know how often that's going to happen and you encourage people to carpool if they can and it doesn't happen every day you know so the the operators of the funeral home indicated if it's a really they expect a really large service a lot of times they won't have it at the funeral home itself they may have the visitation there but they may not have the service there because they just can't handle it you know there be a crematory in the no. building okay. that question was asked no and there won't be any graves or anything like that that question was asked too can't set it up as a cemetery either so. anybody in the audience have questions on this issue okay anybody else council all right roll call Jay Cox yes Williams yes Watson yes Overton yes Wolfer yes Evans yes, Powell yes. okay second Cassie, did you have something else you wanted to Oh, there, I was just going to have Mike go to the next slide because you can see what the zoning is all around it. There's still property to the north of it that's still zoned A1. Been that way a long wow. time. So, yeah, we have we still have a few pockets of those left over in town. Yeah. Okay. Williams? Yes. Watson? Yes. Overton? Yes. Fulfer? Yes. Evans? Powell? Yes. Jaycox? Yes. Both the ordinance emergency clause carry 7-0. And again, we have emergency clause on these pending because there are pending transactions to happen for the emergency. Mike, can you go to the next one? Um, this is a request to rezone uh, 14 acres at the intersection of Highway 112 and Harbor Avenue. Their request is to rezone the property from A1 to RE, a residential estate. Uh, Planning Commission reviewed this request, recommends approval of the uh, zoning request the title of the ordinance reads an ordinance amending ordinance number 3307 the same being the zoning ordinance of the city of Springdale Arkansas on the plat pertaining thereto by rezoning certain lands from agricultural district a1 to resident residential estate re and declaring an emergency with the ordinance pass a second. second motion is second to approve the ordinance uh, any other questions or comments a patsy on residential estates that's a minimum of half acre one acre one acre one acre lots yes anyone in the audience okay Denise yeah Overton yes Fulfer yes Evans Powell yes Jay Cox yes Williams yes second Overton yes Fulfer yes Evans Powell yes Jay Cox yes Williams yes Watson yes both the ordinance emergency clause carry seven zero. And I guess I should have noted that this is a piece of property that was split when we put her revenue through, and they're only rezoning the property on the south side. Okay. What now? When we put Harbor Avenue, it was a larger track. It was split when that uh, when the road went through. So they and actually own property on both sides, but they're only rezoning the south side. Well, yeah. Picture in our packet shows both sides. Yes. We got all that cleared up, made sure the legal description was correct, and they're only rezoning this 14 acres on the south side. Yes, I should have said uh, that okay. before. Uh. The next request is to rezone 20 acres located uh, on the south side of Julio Road. 
Uh, the request is to rezone the property from uh, low density, low medium single family residential district SF2 to medium density single family residential district SF3. Planning Commission reviewed the request and recommends approval of this rezoning request. The title of the ordinance reads an ordinance amending ordinance number 3307, the same being the zoning ordinance of the City of Springdale, Arkansas, and the plat pertaining thereto by rezoning certain lands from low medium density single family residential district SF2 to medium density single family residential district SF3 and declaring an emergency. And let me say the difference between the SF2 and the SF3 is the lot size and an SF3 allows six units per acre as opposed to an SF2 that allows four units per acre and it's a 60 foot lot with 7,000 square feet rather than a 70 foot 8,000 square feet. That's the difference between the two. Still so only single family. I move the ordinance pass. Second. Motion is second. Other comments or questions? Why, why would we consider doing this? If it's already SF2, what makes it more appropriate for us? It increases the density slightly. It gives the developer an opportunity to do better use the property, laying it out. We're asking that the street be extended all the way through to Julio. Um, beyond that, I can't. I don't know that it's a. Yeah. To uh, your question was no, to us. I don't think it's. I yeah. don't think it's a an advantage to us, but I don't think it's necessarily a disadvantage. Mm -hmm. You know that they're, the, they're the, living on. They're going to have smaller yards to mow. And, yeah. Yeah. The you know. trend is to go to smaller, smaller lot sizes. People don't want big yards to take care of. It decreases. You know, it, it helps with the cost of building affordable housing. Not that this is all affordable housing. Uh, I mean, the developer's here if you want to hear his take on why he wants a Well, even right now to develop property and the cost of property itself, you almost have to try to lower the, the minimums on these so that we can, you, the developers can even make it work financially. The days of good cost lot land is slowly going away. We didn't learn everything we should have learned the last time. And the prices are going up really fast again. So. <clears throat> And you're, uh, you said they're extending what street? The street that's on yeah. the... Uh, Off of Don Tyson? Uh-huh. The access point what that's is on the, the west side. What is the street, do you know? Let me tell you I can't, I can't read it from here. But that would be Tyson off Heights. Don Tyson or off of Butterfield Coat? No, it's off of Don, Don Tyson. Tyson. It's Tyson, Tyson Heights. Heights. It's Tyson Heights Street, and it'll be extended all the way up to so tie into Julio. Because they need a second access, access point. Will access off Julio, too? Yeah, it has to have two access points with the number of lots that are going in there. Yeah. Well, we've got a motion to second. Any other comments? Anyone in the audience? Okay, Denise. Wolfer? Yes. Evans? Yes, ma'am. Powell? Yes. Jaycox? Yes. Williams? Yes. Watson? Yes. Overton? Yes. Second. Okay. Okay. Evans? Yes, ma'am. Powell? Yes. Jaycox? Yes. Williams? Yes. Watson? Yes. Overton? Yes. Wolfer? Yes. Well, the ordinance emergency clause carries 7 0. And as you can see, there's a mixture of housing around that. There's the PUD to the east of it that we approved quite some time ago. There's single family. The other to the uh, northwest of that is a higher density in MF4. So it's kind of a mixture of development of densities in that area, too. So, okay. The next request is to rezone 6.5 acres. Located on Butterfield Coach Road, this is a property just south of the neighborhood market that was submitted as part of that commercial subdivision. They are requesting to rezone that from Thoroughfare Commercial District C5 to High Density Multifamily Residential District MF24. Planning Commission reviewed this request and recommends approval of the rezoning request. The title of the ordinance reads an ordinance amending ordinance number 3307, the same being the zoning ordinance of the city of Springdale, Arkansas, and the plat pertaining thereto by rezoning certain lands from Thoroughfare Commercial District C5 to High Density Multifamily Residential District MF24 and declaring an emergency. Second. I'm sorry, I was thinking. That's a, that's a lot of units will be on there, Patsy. Well, I, we have. If they seen maximize it. Yeah, we haven't seen a, a plat of it, but 24 units times 
times six, whatever that is. I don't do multiplication in my head. <laughs> I'm just not geared that way, you know. It's, 250 yeah. units, 250. Okay. On this kind of development schools. you see in a lot of Stop places it. where the higher density serves as a buffer between the commercial and the highway and, and is a step down as you go further south on Butterfield Coach, I think we'll see lower density stuff. But this gives us an opportunity to create a buffer from that commercial as we step down Butterfield Coach Road too. I was, as a, I was thinking in terms of the school districts. Mm -hmm. I, it's I not the infrastructure you, at all. Pardon in me. terms of, what? Oh, school of the school districts. Oh, school districts. Less than 150. That's what I was considering. It's not the infrastructure. It's there to handle that. It's certainly close to the neighborhood market. There's a clinic there. There's access is great. Yeah, access is great. You no, have, access is great. You have 412. You have direct access to, Absolutely. to Don Tyson Parkway. Absolutely. It's a good location as far as that's concerned, yes. But I was just thinking in terms of the schools. Yeah. Oh, there, there is a new school that is going out that direction though isn't there there is property has been purchased out there for another school it's not the one it's not the one that they're building next it's my understanding they're going to the one in tiny town in next. barrington on yeah. barrington mm -hmm. okay yeah but there is another school location that has been purchased and it there. usually takes how long i think somebody i asked this it was like three to five years once occupation um in um apartments and townhomes uh big areas before it actually makes a huge impact on the schools i can't verify that for you I, it takes a while to build i think so yeah which would get by some time if um well, it's just a consideration it's not that i would oppose this has, project but i agree it's just something I agree. to consider it's you know maybe it's time to build some bigger schools and all right any other comments anyone in the audience okay Yes. Daycox? Yes. Williams? Yes. Watson? Yes. Overton? Yes. Fulfer? Yes. Evans? Second. Daycox? Yes. Williams? Yes. Watson? Yes. Overton? Yes. Fulfer? Yes. Evans? Yes. Powell? Yes. Emergency clause carry seven zero. The next item is a conditional use request for a use unit 28, which is a home occupation in a single family residence at 3084 Greenwich Street. Uh, this would be an embroidery operation. There will be nobody coming to the, to the house or anything like that. It'll, everything will be done and delivered. Uh, Planning Commission recommends approval of this uh, home occupation at this location with the following conditions. No alteration of the outside appearance of the residential structure, provision of a separate outside entrance for the business areas of the residential structure, no outside storage of materials required for the operation of the business, operated only by the resident members of the household and shall not have any employees, concessionaires, or any other form of operator or helper, whether such business is conducted on the premises or off the premises. Requires the use of an area no greater than 30% of the total heated living space of the residential structure. Generates no traffic, parking, and sewage or water use in excess of what is normal in the residential neighborhood. Will not produce any fumes, odors, noise, or any other offensive effects that are not normal to <laughs> residential activity. Will not involve accessory buildings and stock and, and trade shall not exceed 10% of the floor area of the accessory use. What did you say the trade was? It's an embroidery operation. Yep. I'll move the resolution pass. Okay, we have a motion and a second to pass the resolution. Any other comments or questions? Anyone in the audience on this one? Okay, Denise. Williams? Yes. Watson? Yes. Overton? Yes. Fulfer? Yes. Evans? Powell? Yes. Jaycox? Yes. 37 0. Uh, the next request is a re, uh, waiver of sidewalk requirements in conjunction with a single family home being built at 8159 East Brown Road, a single family dwelling. Planning Commission reviewed this request and recommends a, approval of the waiver of this, uh, the sidewalk construction. Uh, title of the resolution reads, a resolution approving a waiver of street improvements, drainage, curbs, gutters, and sidewalks is set forth in ordinance number 3725 to Marcy Kennard in connection with 8159 East Brown Road, a single family dwelling, and that would be with option one. I make a motion. Second. Okay. We have a motion and a second. Any other questions or comments? Anyone? Okay, Denise. Watson? 
Yes. Overton? Yes. Wolfer? Yes. Evans? Howe? Yes. Jaycox? Yes. Williams? Yes. The next item is a request for a waiver of street improvements for a fourplex that's being built on uh, Gutensohn, no, on yeah. Gutensohn, right. Uh, this is a small track just south of those duplexes. It's been there for a long time. It has a single family home on it. It's having a fourplex built on it. The street improvements on Gutensohn have been made. The sidewalk is there, the curb and gutter is there. The master street plan shows long term that this would be a minor collector. What? I'm sorry. A minor collector. Okay. Uh, so the, the developer is asking to be waived of that requirement. They're willing to dedicate the right of way, but they're not going to do, they don't want to do any street improvements and let it continue as it is operating today. Uh, well, if we didn't waive it, what would they be required to do? They have to widen it out on their side of the street, that little piece to meet the new standards. Which oh, yeah. Even though no the rest of the road wouldn't be? Yeah. yeah. These, these infill lots like this are going to be kind of strange for a while. What it does allow us with this waiver of street improvements to go ahead and give the right away. If sometime in the future we need to widen this out, later. yeah, we wouldn't have to go back and purchase that right away. So the title of the resolution reads, a resolution approving a waiver of street improvements, drainage, curb scudders, and sidewalks is set forth in ordinance number 3725 to Griffin Fourplex in connection with in 1923 a non-large scale development with recommendation for option one. Move the resolution pass with option one. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Any further comments or questions? Anyone? Okay, Denise. <coughs> Overton? Yes. Fulfer? Yes. Evans? Yes, Powell? Yes. Jaycox? Yes. Williams? Yes. Watson? Yes. Very seven zero. And the last item is really an amendment to an existing tandem lot split that has already been approved. They are adding a small piece onto this piece of property so they can build a, a shop on it and it wasn't included in the original uh, tandem lot that was approved. So we went back through the process so this could be added to the tandem lot. Planning Commission recommends approval of this revision to this uh, conditional use for tandem lot. Title of the resolution reads, a resolution approving a conditional use at 3362 North 48th Street is set forth in ordinance number 4030. Resolution pass. Okay, we have a motion and a second to approve. Any other comments or questions? One. Okay. Wolfer? Yes. Evans? Yes, Howe? Yes. Jaycox? Yes. Williams? Yes. Watson? Yes. Overton? Yes. Seven zero. All right, item, parks and, uh, item 10 is Parks and Rec Committee and uh, Chairman's Mike Lawson. Mike couldn't be here tonight. Uh, somebody else at committee like to take that? Oh. Yeah, I agree. Over. I will take uh, Mike Lawson. I'm not sure where he's at tonight, but I'll, I'll go ahead and <laughs> take this. Some sort of a contest? Uh, and pictures. Um, we had a resolution brought to us authorizing the execution of a construction manager contract for Parks and Recreation, a center remodel project number CP 1904. Uh, recommendation for approval. Wyman. Yeah, Wyman. Uh, well, Chad might have. If y'all want to add anything before we let pe people know what we're talking about. I think you both talked some at committee. You looked at a preliminary, so you can tell more than I can. Okay. Um, we're looking to hire commerce to uh, help to, for construction managers so we can uh, get competitive bids for building of the, our offices at the new rec center. Right. This is not unlike what we do with other projects right. where we try and involve the CM early on to help get accurate pricing as the as the design is developed. I move the resolution pass. Second. second. A motion a second. Any further comments or questions? Anyone? Okay, Denise. Evans? Yes, ma'am. Howe? Yes. Jaycox? Yes. Williams? Yes. Watson? Yes. Overton? <laughs> yes. Fulfer? Yes. I'm concentrating on how cold I am. It is so freezing in here. 
I was trying to get someone's attention to turn the air down. That is a flood. We're just really trying to make it. <laughs> We're going to make everyone really appreciate that new building in about a year. <laughs> so, this is the second meeting uh, I need to wear a parka. All right. Item 11 is our Finance Committee Chairman Jeff Watson. Finance Jeff. Committee met and considered uh, purchasing uh, one of the pieces of property that we're trying to acquire along Spring Street. It's 418 Spring Street. The city Attorney brought this uh, proposal to us. Uh, the property owners agreeing to sell for only 4,000 more than what the city's appraisal was. The committee felt like that was uh, a fair uh, proposal and recommended that the uh, purchase be go forward, recommended to the council with a recommendation for approval. And the title to the resolution reads, the resolution authorizing the purchase of property located at 418 Spring Street, Springdale, Washington, County, Arkansas. Move the resolution pass. Second. Motion is second to approve the resolution. Any other comments or questions? The uh, the person living there that's selling this property, um, are we going to allow them to stay until they're able to get into apartment? Wyman's coming. I, Wyman's had those discussions. I think we're going to be very flexible as they need what with what they need. He may be in a hurry. Sounds like he's already found a house. Okay. But. So he's in, in a hurry to move. Aren't kicking him out in the cold. <laughs> <laughs> Since when does that bother you? Anybody else? Question? Could I make one little suggestion for future proposals? In this resolution, resolution, yes, it's worded um, the amount is based on the owner's appraisal and is only $4,000 more than the appraisal conducted by the city on the property. I don't think it should say is only four thousand dollars. It's the way it's worded. I, I think that could be better. Were you reading that on in the, the resolution? I will leave the word "only" out in the future. I think that would behoove us. Mm -hmm. I don't mind. I, you're looking at the paper. No, I'm looking on my iPad. Yeah. Uh, just above where iPad. now they're. Oh, oh, the oh last you're reading whereas. actual. I was reading the title. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's on I, me. I just suggest That's well we taken. not use yeah. that wording in the future. Hi. Don't need the. Uh, Hi, I? Don't need the commentary. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Good. Thanks it's for only, trying. It is only four thousand more. Helped us do it though, yeah. Ernest. Good job. Uh, Thank you. Uh, all right. Thanks. Any other comments? Questions? All right, Denise. Al. Yes. Jay Cox. Yes. Williams. Yes. Watson. Yes. Overton. Yes. Fulfer. Yes. Evans. Just so I clear that up to make sure, in case people are watching. Oh. The, the property owner, the homeowner got a, got their own appraisal, yes. and that was 4000 only. only 4, it was $4,000 more. <laughs> I don't disagree It wasn't that. that we agreed to pay more than the appraisal. They had an appraisal that I understand. we thought was reasonable. I thought that. It was only 4000 more than ours. It's a little I, no, thing, but I think it's I, I got you. worth I got you. noting. Thanks for pointing that out. <laughs> uh, all right, item 12, Health, Sanitation, Property Maintenance Committee. And that's uh, Chairman Brian Powell. Brian? Thank you, Mayor. Our last committee meeting, uh, we had a presentation by the Springdale Water Utilities. Gave us a presentation on Ben, where we are, where we're going. And um, in the presentation, they were looking at uh, rate increases. And so they came to us with this wonderful presentation, done a great job, and they wanted to set a date for a public hearing for November 12th at 6 p.m. So the title of this resolution is a resolution setting a public hearing date pursuant to Arkansas Code 14-235-223 on a proposed ordinance establishing and setting rates for sanitary sewer service in the city of Springdale, Arkansas. And again, they uh, requested that that be, be set at November the 12th at 6 p.m. Thank you, Brian. That will. Uh uh, that'll be our next city council meeting. Correct. Three weeks. We got an extra week this month, so it, it'll be th in three weeks. But it will be at a city council meeting. Okay. Second. All right. We've got a motion and a second to approve the resolution. Any other comments or questions? I'd like to say that you know, of course, this discussion has already been had in a meeting that wasn't on camera. But just to let our residents know that even though we're raising the rates, they're still, I believe, this is still going to be the lowest rates. 
in this entire area, but we provide the best infrastructure of any city. So uh, anytime somebody here is raising rates or taxes or anything, I think their ears perk up, but we still are going to have the lowest rates in the area. Good point. And at the public hearing, uh, I'm sure they'll be here and they'll be able to uh, answer questions but the amount of time and effort that they put into this and master plan this out is really incredible and and they're um, they came to us saying how they are really trying to keep rates as low as possible but providing a service that's better than anybody around so it's really impressive how they presented it to us all you have to do is take a tour of our facilities and to understand the the uh, significance of the job that this particular uh, department does and you can appreciate uh, why we are where we are now with our level of development and our plans for the future development. Absolutely. Well, and let me add this too. The, the plan that they put together, I mean, the book is mm -hmm. about six inches tall. This was nothing, because I, I, this, this, if I was someone that didn't realize this, I'd ask this question, is this because of any uh, any annexation issues that may arise in the future. And this was done before that conversation even started. So this is not an attempt to cover expenses of any future annexation that might take place. Um, yeah, they, uh, we, we, I, we should be very proud and our, our residents should be very proud of our uh, water utility. When, when you've got a community like many in Northwest Arkansas that are growing as fast as Springdale and have the development challenges they have to, they are, they have positioned themselves over the past several years to be very flexible and very fluid and able to uh, to to address uh, needs that come up uh, connected to development that nobody saw coming. And I don't know of any water utility in the state that's able to do it better than Springdale Water Utility and and. Uh, uh, and and then to, to have all that and still have the lowest rates in the area, I think is, is remarkable. So, uh, so we've got a resolute, we got a motion and a second to approve the date for the uh, public hearing. Okay, Denise. Daycox. Yes. Williams. Yes. Watson. Yes. Overton. Yes. Fulfer. Yes. Evans. Yes, Howe. Yes. All right. And can I interject real quick? The 13th, I have budget meeting on here but there's no time and I don't think there was on any of the emails sent to us but it said somewhere 530 Wyman do you know budget? what what times do we have for the budget meetings Jeff may know but I know no, I know I know on the fourth it's after committee and on the 18th it's after committee yeah. um, but on the 13th it gave no information as to a time well, we do committees at 530 so I, I think we just do it at 530 that's on a Wednesday, the 13th. Oh, so you're saying just keep it at 530 because that's when we will always do it. Okay. I'm fine, fine, fine. We'll just plan on 530 unless we need to move it to a different time. Those all work sessions will begin at 530 p.m. Okay. I knew I read that somewhere. Thank you, Colby. 530. <laughs> or unless Mr. Watson wants a different time. Okay. All right. Good Thank deal. Thank you. That good? Sorry. All right. Let's move on to item 13. <laughs> Street and CIP committee, uh, Chairman Rick Evans. Rick. This is a resolution authorizing the city attorney to settle a <clears throat> lawsuit wherein Eric R. Cullens and Nancy V. Cullens, trustees of the Nancy V. Bauer Living Trust, are defendants. This is uh, four parcels on East Maple Street and East Maple Street project. The property owners have extended an offer to settle the case for a total of $10,000. The city's estimate of just compensation is $4,400. They did provide written justification for the additional $5,600. The committee's recommendation is this be And I just put the word on the administration. <laughs> I, I, I would point out it's only $5,600 <laughs> additional dollars. <laughs> well. There we go. Second. <laughs> All right, we got a motion and a second. Any other comments or questions? <clears throat> Anyone? Hey, Denise. Williams? Yes. Watson? Yes. Overton? Yes. Fulfer? Yes. Evans? Yes, ma'am. Powell? Yes. Jaycox? Yes. Very 7 0.
Move the resolution pass. Second. We've got a motion and a second. Any further questions or comments? What was the, uh, Brad, could you tell us how that bid came in versus projection? It came in about $250,000 above the, the most recent engineer's estimate, but was pretty close to the one we did back in 2016. Okay. All right. So it's a program, a cum cumulative total was 2.232. So is this, this doesn't include the right of way acquisition and any of that? I'm not sure what number you're looking at. 1.893 was the construction contract. Yeah, it would not include suites or construction. right of way and utility. Okay. Not include right of way or utility Utilities. relocation. <coughs> okay. Any other questions? Watson? Yes. Overton? Yes. Wolfer? Yes. Evans? Yes, Powell? Yes. Jaycox? Yes. Williams? Yes. We were invited by the Walton Family Foundation to submit an application for two different grant programs for uh, trail development in Springdale. Uh, is the first one on the agenda the uh, Dean's Trail? Yes. Okay. Yes. Uh, oh, no, I'm sorry. Spring Creek's first. Spring, Spring Creek Trail. Yeah. Okay. This, I, I have them in the wrong order in my deal. Uh, we were uh, invited to apply for $760,000 for this grant. This will allow us to con construct the trail across the Game and Fish property from 40th Street to I-49, the trail to be built from Thunder Chicken, where it is now, all the way over to 40th Street, is being funded with uh, trail set-aside money in the Public Works Department. Uh, the Game and Fish Commission talked about putting the trail, but even if the Walton Family Foundation had given the money directly to Game and Fish, they couldn't take the money because it, they would have to go back through the legislature and all that. So it just worked better for the city to be able to take this grant funds and use it and con con consolidate it into one contract. So we will get the trail built from Thunder Chicken all the way across <coughs> with a street crossing around, across 40th Street and uh, all the way to I-49. The next phase of it would be to go under 49 and then continue on across to the west. So. Uh, the title of the resolution reads, a resolution authorizing the mayor and city clerk to enter into a grant agreement with the Walton Family Foundation for the construction of Spring Creek Trail extension across property owned by Arkansas Game and Fish. Resolution passed. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Any further comments or questions? Mayor, this was, uh, this was a, kind of a last minute addition at committee and we really didn't have time to go over this, but I think we talked about an 80-20 match, but this resolution here says 50-50. <coughs> well, our portion of doing the trail from Thunder Chicken to 40th Street is more than 50% of the cost of going across the other. Okay. So, um, so what's I our think the 80-20 is on the when we when we are have an RDOT grant like well, a well, and we like got a tap grant. we got a tap uh, grant to be part that. of that, and it's 80-20. Yeah. Yes. yes. Part of the Spring Creek. Part we got Spring Creek. Right yeah, we got Spring okay. Creek tap grant. Tap grant for that one, which helps make part of the cost up on that. But the yeah the the fifty fifty, our 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 match whatever match we get from like the eighty the eighty percent that goes toward or the, then the the Waltons match that <laughs> the Walton grant matches that right. We we take whatever federal dollars we can get and we match it dollar for dollar with the Walton Family Foundation. That's the tap. That's the tap grant, right? And then they added us another 760000 so that we can get all this built all the way across. So the city's paying less than 50%. Right. Okay. So when it says uh, any remainder through the capital improvement program, do we have any idea what we're, I mean, we don't want to accept this and then not have any idea what it may take out of our CIP. Well, at this point, we don't know that there's going to be anything else. The final alignment has not been settled. There's a deep ravine that has to go across depending on how we cross that and what we have to do with acquisition are the two unknowns that we have on this one. And that's not the portion that this grant is for. This is the portion that the city already is paying for out of the trails money. 
it's complicated. Yeah. But the likelihood that we're going to use CIP is I, I, not well. Not likely because this is something that's already been. In I the would works. say Brad's back there shaking his head. I'd say not likely. Yeah. I mean, there's always that chance. I mean, if, you could get into a rock in, yeah. that you got a blast that you have no idea of knowing when you get into those kind of things. And as it looks now, there shouldn't be any problem with it. So, as far as we can possibly know, right? Of course, you, you got to. You can't know everything before you yep. start a project. But as far as we can possibly know, we've got the match. We got the money mm -hmm. we need. Yeah. In and the trails set aside the right. budget each year we just have to identify for a grant application with the walton family foundation the possibility of funding if there are any overs that they will not pick up so we we can move forward with this but then if we run into something where we see the cost of this is going to be substantial to our cip where we the council may not want to move forward with yeah. that we can always yeah well, we can always negotiate with the waltons on something we didn't know about either Okay, any other questions, comments? Okay, Denise. Overton? Yes. Bulfer? Yes. Evans? Yes, ma'am. Howe? Yes. Jaycox? Yes. Williams? Yes. Watson? Yes. Carry 7 0. Brad's behind you, Patsy. Do you have something you need to add, Brad? I was going to say I will bring a cash flow for the, both of these projects to you at committee. We've cash flowed out three years worth, so. Yeah, okay. I'm bringing my cash to the committee. Yeah, he's bringing you cash in the bucket uh, oh, the committee yeah. on, on a piece of paper, right? I heard that right. Well, in order to make sure we know when we were going to to match even the funds, and we've we've had quite a bit of negotiation with the Walton Family Foundation to make sure we're not committing more than we have any one year, and it's a three-year commitment on their part. The Dean's Trail is the next one, and they ask us to apply for two and a half million dollars, but they're giving us three million dollars. And this is for phase two and phase three A. And the match money for this one is really kind of unique because we have two TAP grants to do the tunnel underneath, underneath uh, 412 for a million dollars. And that's allowing us to have part of the match for that. And then we have applied for a half million dollar grant for um, state TAP money, which we, we have that half million dollars so we can match that one. And we applied for another one, which we didn't get, but we have a chance to apply for it again. So all of those federal dollars that we get can take up part of our match money, and we have two years to figure out how to get the rest of this together before we actually go to construction on this one. Now, the tunnel itself has to be completed the first phase, and that will get Dean's Trail underneath 412 and over to Oriel Street because the two TAP grants we have on that has to be committed by in under contract by spring. Right. So that one will move forward. The 3A won't move forward until we have the rest of the grant funds in place and we apply for everything that we can get to provide the local match as much as we can. I want to kudos to Patsy and to Brad and working with uh, and of course certainly the Walton Family Foundation but but I think uh, I think the, the people of Springdale would be very pleased with if they got an overall picture of the trails that we've we've seen built in Springdale. How little actual city money is in those? I didn't. So yeah. because of the generosity of of the Walton family, plus uh, our uh, success and some help that we've gotten in other areas uh, with with tap grants. Yeah, and I'm working on a spreadsheet after this comes through to show you. What percentage of actual taxpayer money in Springdale has gone to trails? And you'll be surprised how little there is because we have maximized every dollar that we can to get trails. But I didn't read the title of this resolution, though. A resolution authorizing the mayor and city clerk to enter into a grant agreement with the Walton Family Foundation for the construction of Dean's Trail. The resolution passed. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Any further questions or comments? Anyone? Okay, Denise. Bulfer? Yes. Evans? Yes, Powell? Yes. Jaycox? Yes. Williams? Yes. Watson? Yes. Overton? Yes. <clears throat> All right. We're at item 14, and I'm going to turn that one over to our city attorney, Ernest Kate. Thank you. Item 14 uh, requested it be withdrawn because we received payment on this one today. Good. 4051 Benjamin, that was the Bench County property, so that's been uh, withdrawn. On to item 15, which is an ordinance authorizing the city clerk to file a cleanup lien for the removal of overgrown brush and debris on property located within the city of Springdale, Arkansas, located at 2688 Carondelet and 1304 Young Street. Is 
Second. We've got a motion and a second to approve the ordinance. Are there other questions or comments? Does anyone in the audience need to address these properties? Either of these. Okay. Denise? Evans? Yes, ma'am. Howe? Yes. Jaycox? Yes. Williams? Yes. Watson? Yes. Overton? Yes. Fulfer? Yes. Second. Howe? Yes. Jaycox? Yes. Williams? Yes. Watson? Yes. Overton? Yes. Fulfer? Yes. Evans? Yes, ma'am. Ordinance emergency clause carries 7 -0. All right, thank you, Ernest. We've got comments from council members. Anybody? City attorney? No, sir. Uh, I do, ha I do want to remind everyone, remind the council we and, and the public that we have a public meeting at Central Junior High, uh, 5 to 7 this coming Thursday, correct, Ashley? Did we find out where in the junior high? The multi-purpose room of the junior high, okay, of Central Junior High. So that's uh, that'll be... And that's a drop in. We'd encourage our residents to come by. The, the public meeting has to do with, I don't think I said, has to do with the harbor to Emma connection, uh, the overpass over I 40, including the overpass over I 49. All right. Uh, I'd entertain a motion to adjourn. Absolutely. Got a motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. Thank you. We're adjourned.